Welcome back to another episode. This is part two. Part two. This is the Corporate Cowboys podcast. My name is Alex, your host. Right back to business. This is season seven, episode two. And we're on part two of this book, The Naked Corporation, How the Age of Transparency Will Revolutionize Business. The authors are Don Tapscott and David T. Cole. This shit was published 2002 by Free Press. I don't mean it's shit like it's a shit book. It's a good book. But this shit right here was published 2002 by Free Press. So onward. Chapter two is titled Transparency versus Opacity. The Battle. Ooh. Transparency may in general be a good thing, but it's not always the right thing, nor may it always be practical. And it has its enemies. Transparency can be controversial, poorly executed, or placed at risk. All in all, while the world is becoming more open, there are many obstacles to complete transparency, some valid and some not. Subtitle, Obstacles to Transparency, and the little mini subtitle, Limits to Knowledge. So there's some obstacles to transparency. One of those, one of those is, is limits, limits to knowledge. We can only take action on what we know. Critical information like Enron's role in manipulating the California energy markets may not become known in a timely manner. Information, events, and complexity tend to increase geometrically. Science and technology have limits. Indeed, the more we know, the more we realize what we don't know. As H. L. Mencken once said, penetrating so many secrets, we cease to believe in the unknowable. But there it sits, licking its chops. Yo, for those who don't know who H. L. Mencken is, that motherfucker had some based takes, all right? So go go Google him. Go look him up. Use whatever search engine you have to. Look him up. He's got some based takes. But as with every author, every commentator, every, um, every speculator, every observer, take their views with a grain of salt. Even my own, all right? And if you haven't noticed, yes, I'll be providing commentary every now and then on uh, the views of this book given that it's more than 20 years old so you know just uh just to provide a little reality check on what shit looks like in 2023 so continuing environmental impacts are often only discovered after they become irreversible a 2002 study by the world bank the World Resources Institute, and the United Nations said that several ecosystems are fraying under the impact of human activity and that in the future, ecosystems will be less able than in the past to deliver the goods and services on which human life depends. The study concludes, it's hard, of course, to know what will truly, what will be truly sustainable. It's hard of course, to know what will be truly sustainable. Because, the quote continues, our knowledge of ecosystems has increased dramatically, but it simply has not kept pace with our ability to alter them. In another study, the World Economic Forum reached a similar conclusion. Businessmen always say, quote, what matters gets measured. Yet, look at environmental policy, and the data is lousy. Yeah, so not much measurement going on there, or not the right kind of measurement going on there, because today's day and age, the World Economic Forum touts, pretty much boasts, pretty much um, brags that you will own nothing and you will be happy. How funny is that? <laughs> the good news, it says here, is that thanks to technology, we chip away at the mountain says Daniel Esty of Yale University, I see a revolution in environmental data collection coming because of computing power, satellite mapping, remote sensing, and other information technologies. One example is the long-running battle between U.S. Midwestern states, which are heavy coal users, and Northeastern states, which suffer from acid rain. 
Technology helped prove New York's claim that its acid rain problem was not just the result of homegrown pollution. Another subtitle, The Business Value of Secrets. Much of a company's information is rightly confidential, whether for competitive or for privacy reasons. Innovations, market entry plans, proprietary business methods, pending mergers and acquisitions, and a host of other matters must be kept secret for varying periods of time. Parties to a transaction also benefit from information asymmetries. Uh, Asymmetries are not having the same information, where one side has more or a different quality of information than the other, giving them an advantage. Asymm asymmetrical necessarily means uh, ad not advantaging. Is advantaging an adverb? Advantaging one side. That's benefiting one side. There you go. Benefiting one side. Parties to a transaction also benefit from information asymmetries. Your car dealer may have more information about the problems with your car than you do. You may know more about your health than your life insurance company. Parties will attempt to gain advantage through a monopoly over information if they can. Firms with ethical obligations of confidentiality as well. They must protect employee records, customer information, and the like. Transparency means visibility into the operations of institutions, not the personal information of individuals. Experience shows that good privacy policies pay off. Firms sometimes have good business reasons to be opaque and play in the danger zone, but the danger zone can be risky, as the Kellogg's corn dog fiasco illustrates. For more, yeah, I mean, just a side comment. For more information on what the danger zone is, that is uh, the relative relationship, the correlative relationship between a, a company's transparency and the political action that its stakeholders are likely to exercise given that transparency. And uh, if you want to know more about this, about the Kellogg's corn dog fiasco, go listen to part one. Part one is juicy as fuck, like a corn dog with all the fucking, with all the um, condiments. There you go. Firms sometimes have good business reasons to be opaque, play in the danger zone, blah, blah, blah. The danger zone can be risky as the Kellogg's corn dog fiasco illustrates. These are shifting sands, it says. What yesterday was considered proprietary, that's executive compensation, for example, is today on the public record. Some firms, following strategy guru Michael Porter's long-proven advice, pre-announce plans to outflank the competition, while others play close to the chest. Even in areas formally considered competitive and proprietary, transparency is changing the rules. Yeah, some motherfuckers... Somehow, fuck that. <laughs> Why am I cussing? Some organizations, some individuals, some persons, if you will, real, natural, or legal, fictitious, some persons will leak information. We'll just straight up call it leak, right? They'll let certain information leak about potential moves they might make, about prospective moves they are making that are in the works in order to gain some kind of advantage. There's always, you know, there's a method to the madness. There's a motive behind everybody's moves, behind everybody's uh, plays in the field. And uh, corporate war is no different. So these are shifting sands. Some play close to the chest. Even in areas formerly considered competitive and proprietary, transparency is changing the rules. The open source model of fostering innovation, such as with the Linux computer operating system, relies on co-creation and aggressive transparency on matters that some firms still consider proprietary. Open source has scored major successes. Linux, for example, has migrated from the fringe to the mainstream. Yes, and this is true. A lot of folks, a lot of folks use Linux. The cost of openness. This is the next subtitle. The next mini title. The cost of openness. The next subheading. 
subheading. Active transparency costs money for new organizational functions, tracking and reporting, interaction with stakeholders, and outside auditing. For a small or low-margin business, such expenses can be practically a showstopper. Borland Software, a California company with $300 million in sales, says that the 2002 Sarbanes-Oxley rules for corporate disclosure result in new bills of $3 million a year, about 10% of its earnings. This is due to the added costs of accounting scrutiny. Legal help, including two newly hired in-house attorneys dedicated to compliance and $1 million in added director and officer insurance costs. Companies like BP, that's British Petroleum, Ford, and Hewlett-Packard spend millions on social responsibility staff, annual sustainability reports, external verification, consultants, and the like. The business case exists, but each company needs to make it. When, sorry, even, even when the spirit is willing and the money is there, few firms have a culture of transparency and most need to invest time and money to build the required processes and infrastructures. The next subheading is pseudo transparency and deceit. Yo, yo, welcome to fucking corporate, eh? Active transparency strives to be inclusive to address the aspirations and needs of all stakeholders. As it aspires to be trustworthy, verif- verif- verifiably, verifiably material and true. And, and it aspires, I'm sorry, I fucked up that sentence. And it aspires to be trustworthy, verifiably material and true. In the past, some firms have benefited from opacity, 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 and dishonesty. Today, more companies than we care to imagine still maintain old practices. Yeah, dog, that's that's the corporate life, corporate corporate world order. I, that'll never end. Others, understanding the growing demand for candor, present themselves as open, though they change little in their values and management style. Faking it what we call pseudo-transparency, is likely to result in information overload, confusion, bad communication, or whitewashing. Sustainability, Sustainability, a UK firm, publishes, in partnership with the UN Environment Program, a global survey on the quality of corporate reporting related to financial, environmental, and social practices. In 2002, Its report points out that few companies around the world provide this scope of transparency reporting, and those that do, a mere handful. And of those that do, a mere handful have adopted rigorous reporting methodologies. Many companies excluded from sustainability's top 50 engage in what some call greenwashing. (laughs) <laughs> self-promotion in the guise of transparency. Hmm. Hmm. Greenwashing. You don't say. Sustainability points favorably to the invasion of the suits, in quotes, the invasion of the suits, as companies increasingly draw on the services of blue chip accounting firms and consultants to audit and validate not only financial, but also environmental and social reports. Yeah. Essentially, they're hiring expert spinners to spin all the reports, all the information they collect so that it appears favorable to them and their stakeholders, their shareholders, so that they continue to attract investors, money, more clients. It says, it continues, by the way, only five of sustainability's 50 top-rated reporting companies are headquartered in the United States. That's Bristol Myers Squibb, Baxter International, Chiquita Brands International, General Motors, and Procter & Gamble. Three, Suncor Energy, BC Hydro, and Alcan are Canadian. The next subheading, Transparency Literacy. A lack of experience with transparency can lead to missteps on the frontier of openness. 
It will take time for businesses to become literate about transparency, to understand its dynamics and boundaries, and to develop the competency and skill required to manage in an open economy. Corporate transparency requires its own form of literacy as the online bests as the online book selling leader Amazon often sails in uncharted waters. In September 1999, the company introduced purchase circles, that's in quotes, purchase circles, which disclosed the book preferences of its corporate customers. Amazon revealed that customers from Microsoft were snapping up the Microsoft file, the secret case against book, sorry, the secret case against Bill Gates. So it's called the it's called the Microsoft file, the secret case against Bill Gates by Wendy Goldman. <laughs> Wendy Goldman Rom, sorry, Wendy Goldman Rom. The Microsoft file, the secret case against Bill Gates by Wendy Goldman Rom. Amazon's review said the book paints a harsh and unforgiving picture that's not at all flattering to Gates or the rest of Microsoft's top brass. Meanwhile, a book on Linux was a hot seller at Intel. Amazon.com spokesman Paul Capelli called purchase circles a discovery tool. We know that people don't make purchases in a vacuum, he said. You buy things based on on what others around you are buying or what they have to say. You look to family, friends, or neighbors. What purchase circles do is allow insight into groups of people that may have significance for you. Some customers, however, thought Amazon's innovation was voyeuristic. Voyeuristic. What, like it was prying? What, like it was uh, overstepping some bounds of some kind? Dog, today we have what's called targeted marketing. And when companies, when organizations collect data on your purchase habits, this shit is viewed as normal. But I guess in 2002, it was still the Wild West and it was uncharted, uncharted territory. Okay. Okay, dog. Continuing. Buyers were uncomfortable with the idea that their book purchases might reflect poorly on their employers or betray a corporate agenda. And the disclosure made them feel as if someone were looking over their shoulders. After asking employees for their reaction to the Amazon program, IBM CEO and chairman Louis Gerstner received 5,000 email responses within hours. More than 90% objected to having their book buying habits as a group disclosed online. After IBM complained, Amazon removed its purchase circle listings. Gerstner wrote to Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos saying, I'm certainly not going to tell you how to run your business, but I do urge you to view this as an enormously important issue. The next... <laughs> Damn, look at where we are today in 2023. Motherfuckers, the, the government is buying information Private organizations are collecting information to flip and sell to other private organizations and, and other private governments. <laughs> yeah, notice how I didn't say public governments, private governments. The negative reaction forced the company to modify the service. Today, customers can ask that their information not be used in generating purchase circle lists, and companies can tell Amazon to delist them. Some privacy advocates insist such policies are still wanting since the burden is on the consumer or company to opt out. Amazon says the feature is popular and now offers purchase circles based on geography, educational institution, industries, and government departments. This amazing story shows that businesses must become transparency literate to better understand what transparency means and how to harness its power. The next little subheading here, structural obstacles. While the world becomes more open, structural supports for opacity continue to rise. United States litigiousness dissuades companies from revealing more than they need to. The main blockers of transparency within firms are often their own lawyers. 
a May 2002 California Supreme Court's 4-3 to three decision against Snikey led many to conclude that social and environmental reporting would become more risky in the future. The courts ruled that when Nike had denied reports that workers were mistreated in the Asian factories that manufactured its shoes, the company's statements constituted, quote, commercial speech and were therefore not covered by the First Amendment. Okay, yeah, for a publicly traded company that's supposed to be in the interest of the company, uh, of, of the public, sorry. At issue were statements that the factory conditions in press releases and correspondence sent out by Nike in 1997, including a letter to the editor that said the sneaker company was doing a good job with overseas labor, but could do better. Quote, because in the statements at issue here, Nike was acting as a commercial speaker because its intended audience was primarily the buyers of its products. And because the statements consisted of factual representations about its own business operations, we conclude that the statements were commercial speech for purposes of applying state laws designed to prevent false advertising and other forms of commercial deception, wrote Justice Joyce Kennard for the majority. The action had been brought against Nike by environmental activist Mark Kasky. Nike appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which in in June 2003 sent it back to the state courts. In the meantime, the effect of the ruling has been that companies could be sued and penalized if their social or environmental reporting broke truth in advertising regulations. As a result, Nike has said it will not issue such reports until the case is resolved. How, how fucking, how convenient, how convenient they can just withhold these reportings that in, to some extent ought to be mandatory. They ought to be, they ought to be um, mandated transparency for publicly traded companies, right? They ought to be mandatory, and yet they say until this case is resolved, we ain't reporting shit. So they can just do whatever they want under the table, and until the case is resolved, until they get a final decision on the matter, until the appeals process is exhausted, they don't have to report shit to you. Damn. That's wild. Transparency fatigue. That's that's the next subheading. Transparency fatigue and paralysis. As the world becomes more open, information proliferates and individuals face increasing numbers of ever more complex choices, possibly to the point of paralysis. Ignorance may not be bliss, but it's less work. (laughs) Now that I know the effects of carbon combustion on global warming, should I dump my SUV? That's still still debated. In 2002, they're using global warming. 2023, they're using climate change because they recognize whoever they are, the international regulators or the puppeteers above them, they recognize the shit is cyclical and so they can't propagandize it it going one way only. (laughs) So should I accept a job with Exxon despite its environmental policies? Should I leave my broker that has been fined for conflict of interest between research and investment banking. This is more than information overload. It is choice overload. Similarly, some business executives are showing fatigue from scrutiny, perhaps leading to, quote, transparency paralysis, as semi-naked corporate executives fear making moves that might further expose them to controversy. Exhibit A, With the extended catering to the stock market, companies are cheap. Billions of dollars sit in corporate treasuries. There are dozens of overexposed sitting ducks and all sorts of industries and crises of overcapacity. Airlines, automotive, financial services, you name it. One would expect lots of merger and acquisition activity. But all there has been is a handful of big deals. Few are buying these bargains. Gordon Nixon, CEO of RBC, 
a financial services firm with assets approaching $300 billion, says that transparency is causing business executives to act like politicians and consider how a decision will be perceived rather than its economic merits. Some executives may retreat to fortress thinking. Others, paralyzed by fear of scrutiny, may hesitate to make the bold moves they need to succeed. Hewlett Packard CEO Carly Fiorina showed courage when she led her company to acquire Compaq in May 2002. The evidence so far suggests it was a good move, but the flack she received from shareholders and commentators has not gone unnoticed by others. Maybe, for example, we'd see more foreign direct investment if companies weren't worried about the super sensitive, politicized business environment. That's funny, it writes that super sensitive, politicized business environment when nowadays you got huge trillion dollar investment firms like <clears throat> BlackRock, BlackRock, and other others internationally, globally, quote unquote, globalized globalized firms uh, that now invest based on virtue points, virtue signal points, uh, woke scores, if you will. Like if a company is pushing the quote unquote right kind of agenda, then they're more than likely to, uh, <laughs> to garner investment dollars from these large firms who, who really just seek to globalize everything and centralize everything under their dominion. Next subheading, the new power of obfuscation. Obfuscation is uh, a, a sort of concealment, a sort of, um, uh, what's the term called? Like conf conf confusing, confusing somebody, covering up, um, deploying like a, a diversion of some, of some kind. In order to in order to hide away material facts and whatnot, the power of obfuscation. The internet's transparency is a double-edged sword. It is a tool for information access, verification, and discovery, but it can also be used to deceive. A 2003 Federal Trade Commission study found that two-thirds of all spam contains inaccurate information. Well, yeah, dog, that's fucking spam. Just about anyone can put up a website claiming virtually anything. Parody websites and campaigns illustrate this duality. Well, those are parodies, not spam. Are they vehicles for transparency, opacity, or both? Question <laughs> mark? December 3, 2002 was the 18th anniversary of the chemical disaster in Bhopal, India, where an accident in a union carbide plant caused poison gas emissions that killed 4,000 residents in their sleep. Damn. This is where an accident in a union carbide plant caused poison gas emissions that killed 4,000 residents in their sleep and injured Several hundred thousand others. Damn. So you're, you're telling me it killed only 4,000? I think those are only 4,000 that were recorded. Because if it hurt, if it injured several hundred thousand others, I mean, you've got to question the response time, especially in a, uh, in a developing country like that, whether 4,000 was really, was really the cap on deaths. <laughs> On that day, journalists around the world received via email a press release appearing to be from Dow Chemical, which inherited the Bhopal issue after it acquired Union Carbide. In the press release, Dow apologized for the death and suffering caused by the industrial accident and explained that its hands were tied on the matter of financial compensation to the victims. The company's first allegiance, it said, was to shareholders and the paramount need to ensure a healthy bottom line. I don't know, fam. That doesn't sound like a parody to me. <laughs> Quote, we understand the anger and hurt, but Dow does not and cannot acknowledge responsibility. If we did, not only would we be required to expend many billions of dollars on cleanup and compensation, much worse, 
the public could then point to Dow as a precedent in other big cases. <laughs> quote, quote, they took responsibility. Why can't you? Amco, BP, that's British Petroleum, Shell, and Exxon all have ongoing problems, and that would just get much worse. We are unable to set this precedent for ourselves and the industry, much as we would like, as much as we would like to see the issue resolved in a humane and satisfying way. For information, the release referred the readers to www.dow-chemical.com. So apparently it was a parody. Apparently. Allegedly a parody. The overbearing attitude of the widely circulated press release sparked thousands of complaints. But the complainers had been duped. Dow had no connection to either the press release or the site. Both were hoaxes. The production of the Yes Men, a group of internet activists who had earlier gained notoriety for bogus sites satirizing the World Trade Organization and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. The press release and site attracted enormous negative publicity for Dow. Dow's lawyers quickly forced the original hoax site to shut down, but another spoof site, DowEthics.com, picked up its content. It offers this tongue-in-cheek corporate boast. Quote, Did you know Dow is responsible for the birth of the modern environmental movement? Rachel Carson's 1962 book, Silent Spring, about the effects of a Dow product, DDT, led to a groundswell of concern and the birth of many of today's environmental action groups. Another example of Dow's commitment to living, improved daily, end quote. <laughs> the site goes on to parody various PR initiatives of the company, such as www.bopal.com, an authentic Dow-sponsored site that presents the company's position on Bhopal. Corporate parody sites are a spinoff of the boom in political parody sites. Virtually every politician with a recognizable name has been skewered by mock sites. A parody site so angered George W. Bush during the presidential election campaign that his officials petitioned the FCC to shut it down. When told the Constitution's freedom of speech provisions protected parody sites, Bush uttered his famous remark, there ought to be a limit on freedom. Damn, fuck that nigga. The Bush campaign's reaction immediately caused the parody site's audience to soar. In May 1999, the site received 6 million hits over the candidate's official site. <laughs> what? Hold on, hold on, hold on. In May 1999, the site received 6 million hits, while the candidate's official site received 30,000. Imagine that. Parody sites can confuse people, as the Dow story illustrates. With off-the-shelf software and a few spare hours, critics can savagely ridicule any company. Appreciative audiences easily forward the bogus press release or site address to friends around the world. The same viral marketing that made Napster an overnight success can now pummel an unsuspecting company with sarcasm. As George W. Bush discovered to his chagrin, trying to crush a parody site simply boosts its notoriety and drives up traffic. The only real defense is to behave in a manner that doesn't invite ridicule. That's some funny shit. It's different from today's uh, 2023. I mean, we're in the era of 2023, the year of our Lord. It's different from the cancellation mob that um, that occurs internationally, really, from academia to politics to uh, to social issues. Now, <clears throat> now, if you say something that's contrary to the quote-unquote mainstream agenda, you could get ridiculed, you could get canceled, you get shamed for um, for not following, I don't know, the mainstream school of thought, for not being a uh, for not being a pot, a bot, towing the line, 
NPC, a sheep, if you will. Obviously, it differs from place to place, geographically, regionally. The next subheading here is the geopolitical context. We have already mentioned companies that aggressively resist being open. Point, first point, Fidelity and other big mutual funds want to keep their proxy votes secret. They say it's because of cost and the need to keep politics out of business decisions. Many suspect it's because Fidelity has a conflict of interest as provider of services like the management of employees' 401k retirement accounts to companies whose shares is whose shares it owns. Sorry. Many suspect it's because Fidelity has a conflict of interest as provider of services to companies whose shares it owns. Second point, Rice Tech sought patents on the name and genetic coding of basmati rice with the goal of privatizing, that's rendering opaque, the common intellectual property of India's farmers. Man, if, I mean, talk about fucking parasites, right? Parasitic, parasitic capitalism. That exists, but at the end of the day, that's not capitalism per se. It's just parasitic corporatism, parasitic cronyism. Pure capitalism wouldn't do that. Kellogg, that's the, the third point. The third point here, Kellogg failed to disclose the genetically modified contents of its corn dog and paid the price when Greenpeace revealed the information. But the battles around openness are being fought on a much broader front. In 2002, 2003, political leadership, terrorism, war, and compliant media combined in the United States to pose challenges to disclosure, transparency, and indeed freedom of expression. Some have charged that the government is using national security to strengthen opacity. No way. You don't fucking say, like the Patriot Act? <laughs> Information restrictions are necessary in areas related to national security. But a broader atmosphere of secrecy provides an example that like-minded business leaders can point to. Meanwhile, the government enacts some measures that protect opaque business practices that arguably threaten security or are irrelevant to it. The Homeland Security Act of 2002 gives the Department of Homeland Security broad powers to receive information from corporations about weaknesses in the country's quote critical infrastructure. This information, this information becomes automatically exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. That's gay. Companies also gain immunity from civil liability if the information reveals wrongdoing and immunity from antitrust suits for sharing the information with the government and each other. Damn, that's wild. So in the name of national security, in the best interests of national interests, and they ain't even like national, they're, they're not even governmental, they're political. That means they're individual. They're going to people. They're going to individuals at the top. In the interests of those interests, if somebody were to blow the whistle on something fucking heavy, right? That information can be deemed exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. So you, so the public could arguably never fucking know about it. It could literally be swept under the rug and exempt, exempt from liability, exempted from liability. So nobody could sue anybody for it either. <laughs> Talk about hegemony, talk about hegemony, talk about uh, oligarchism, some shit like that. Talk about corruption. That's just fucking pure corruption. As much as I like corruption, that's pure corruption. That's not even capitalism at that point. <laughs> it's just a facade, a facade of capitalism. Uh, it's corruption under the guise of capitalism. How about that? United States Senator Patrick Leahy a Vermont Democrat believes these exemptions will be counterproductive. No way. He said, I, I mean, regardless of whether the dude's a Democrat or Republican, Republican, I don't give a fuck. They're in the same circle. When you're in the White House, you're shaking hands and rubbing elbows with just about everybody 
and the same. They're working towards the same interests. And many a times they are against the better interests of their own constituencies. So it's not uh it's not impossible to believe that somebody on Capitol Hill has or grows a conscience. <laughs> Uh, he said, he said they would, quote, encourage government complicity with private firms to keep secret information about critical infrastructure vulnerabilities, reduce the incentive to fix the problems, and end up hurting rather than helping our national security. In the end, more secrecy may undermine, may, sorry, in the end, more secrecy may undermine rather than foster security. Yeah, that's true. Business is war, right? And so long as you're doing good business, then you're preventing bad business from existing, right? Bad business equals bad blood equals blood money, that sort of thing, right? Now, business obviously always becomes personal. And when you're at the top, at the tippy top, and you're pulling the strings, you are necessarily one of the puppeteers for I don't know, your congressional district or whatever the fuck. It's in your best interest to be transparent. But but some folks place their personal interests over the representative interests, right? They got elected by people to represent those people. And yet a lot of those folks at the top fuck over their own people, their own constituents for whatever benefit for insider trading on this on this information that's exempt from FOIA right so they take advantage of of these opportunities maximize their wallets which is which is how you can get you know positions in government like uh let's let's say for example speaker of the house right in 20 in in, in the in the 2020s right in the late in the early 2020s you, you could have a position like speaker of the house and you only make like a couple hundred grand which is a lot it's still a lot it's a considerable amount of money you can make a couple hundred grand salary and yet somehow your portfolio your net worth can increase exponentially literally exponentially the end J- just because <laughs> Because of this shit, because of opacity, you take advantage of of how opaque actual communications, actual government to private organization communications are. You take advantage of those communications and you can necessarily trade on insider information. You're fucking over your own people. You're fucking over the nation. For the sake of your own wallet, you can walk away from a position like that with hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> Leahy also described impacts that have no bearing on national security. For example, if a company submits information that its factory leaches arsenic in groundwater, quote, that information lo- no longer could be used in a civil or criminal proceeding brought by local authorities or by the neighbors who were harmed by drinking the water. That's so retarded. That means that a company could strategically blow a whistle on itself. Just pick a fall guy, give him a little pension at the end of that, give him a little gold parachute, if you will, make a fall guy to report on this information. And then that information could never be used to actually sue the company. (laughs) <laughs> that's 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 devious as fuck. Meanwhile, public support for the underpinnings of transparency has weakened since the 1999, no, sorry, since 1999, the Freedom Forum has surveyed Americans on the following questions. The First Amendment became part of the US Constitution more than 200 years ago. This is what it says. Quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the rights of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Do you agree or disagree with the statement that the First Amendment goes too far in the rights it guarantees? Man, I'm... (laughs) 
I'm not going to say I'm worried or concerned about what folks' answers are. Um, I think by 1999, I think around 2002, folks were, were already growing more dependent on the government, if you will. I mean, farming industry largely is out. A lot of the food that the U.S. consumes <clears throat> is being exported more and more. Sorry, it's being imported. A lot of like the, the, the staple food is being imported more and more. So we're becoming dependent on government's management. We're hoping that the government does a good job of managing our well-being, managing our national livelihood so that we don't go hungry. <laughs> so these folks are going to say, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll trade some of these freedoms for uh, a fucking uh, a sandwich. <laughs> shit reminds, that shit reminds me of, uh, of third world corruption, really. Like that, that's third world corruption antics like you got mexico southern america that shit that shit is normalized out there and it's becoming normalized here in 1999 only 28% of respondents replied that the first amendment goes too far in 2000 this number dropped to 22% but it's jumped to 39% in 2001 hmm i wonder why was it was it something we will never forget? <laughs> September 11th or some shit? And then to 49% in 2002. Damn, so they're sucking government dick. Furthermore, according to the survey, the least popular First Amendment right is the freedom of the press. 42% <laughs> of respondents said the press has too much freedom to do what it wants. 40% said that newspapers should not be allowed to freely criticize the military and so on. Funny enough... I think there's only like three to six companies that own all of mass communications and media, like the newspaper and the news and fucking news channels and shit like that. There's only like three or like three to six companies, like major corporations in the entire world, like on this planet that own mass communications like that. <laughs> so the more you say you don't like, you don't want them to be as free as possible. They're all... Really, all they got to do is just start aligning what they release via the press. All, all have to start aligning them together so it appears like there is some form of control and regulation and like nobody's deviating far out into like left field and right field. And it's still the same one entity, one organization that owns it all. It's just an illusion. <laughs> all right. I said uh, they should not criticize the military okay yeah i mean a lot of fucking war hawks out here all of a sudden huh they want war fucking weirdos military industrial complex weirdos dog they could be doing a lot more with psyops for for the benefit of people not for the manipulation of people but for the benefit and they don't they, they fuck up the bag every fucking day that i'm alive at least they're fucking it up globalization has unleashed new Often invisible forces that frame the issues differently, but the results are similar. World Economic Forum Senior Advisor Claude Smadja, Smadja, Claude Smadja, 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 Claude Smadja comments, The decisions that affect my life, whether my job will be eliminated, will I have a mortgage with higher interest rates, what returns I will get as an investor, are being made by vague institutions and organizations. No way, vague institutions? Vague institutions and organizations? You mean like the World Economic Forum? <laughs> the taste of beer, I think, is decided by European, European Union bureaucrats in Brussels. The taste of beer I drink is decided by European Union bureaucrats in Brussels. There is increased opacity. Op opacity? Am I saying that right? Opacity? Opacity. Opacity. In the old world, if the corporation did well, my job was secure and I could anticipate a raise. Now, if my corporation does well, my job may be more at risk. My company can decide to rationalize production and move our plants to a cheaper geography. Or this guy, John Smith, shows up here occasionally. He's a consultant of some kind. I don't know who he is, but I know he has huge control over my life. Today, a bunch of young fund managers in a room in London, New York, or elsewhere decide 
that my national currency is a bad risk. So interest rates go up and it's harder for me to pay for my house. I don't know what I'm eating. 10 years ago, I didn't need to ask myself if my corn is genetically modified. Well, damn, Claude. Sounds like you got sounds like you got a good head on your shoulders, but you know, that shit can get knocked off quick. <laughs> Such shifts are unfortunate because the costs of opacity are opacity. The costs of opacity are immeasurable. Let's dig deeper. Before the next little subheading here, let me just confirm how to pronounce opacity. The next little subheading here, continuing the costs of opacity. On July 18, 1997, the world awoke to an alarming wave of selling that was devastating currencies and stocks in financial markets across Asia, Latin America, and Europe. Massive waves of capital fled into safe havens as investors lost faith in previously booming developing economies. In previously booming developing economies. A series of bankruptcies began. As the meltdown continued over the following months, Malaysian Prime Minister Maya Mahathir Mohamed, Mahathir Mohamed charged George Soros and other international investors with sucking the wind out of his country's economy. <laughs> this little George Soros gets up, huh? He's, he's pretty relevant in, in 2023, too. Um, that nigga's been alive forever. The Asian financial crisis lasted three years, spilling over to Wall Street and Western economies. A similar crisis hit Russia in 1998. A si mm, similar? How similar? George Soros? These crises brought transparency to the fore. Several factors caused the problems, in particular, an Asian financial bubble that presaged the internet economy in the late 1990s. Many claimed that lack of transparency was one of the causes. Western politicians, economists, and media identified emerging econ e economy, what? Emerging economy corruption, economy, don't you mean economic corruption? Emerging economy, it says economy. Western politicians, economists, and media identified emerging economy corruption, nepotism, and favoritism, along with poor corporate governance, as drivers of the meltdown. You don't say. Lack of disclosure by companies, commercial banks, and even central banks had fanned the crisis. No way. You don't say. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, in particular, declared that henceforth, transparency must be the, quote, golden rule for a globalized economy, gay, and that it would take charge of strengthening the supervision of financial and banking systems in developing countries. No way. The IMF sticking their finger in everybody's pot. That's, that's, I would have never guessed. Fucking color me, color me surprised. <laughs> Uh, if for more information, if you want some context on the IMF, go read Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins. Under strong pressure, many emerging economic leaders opened their economic systems to new levels of international scrutiny. In retrospect, some analysts, notably Joseph Stiglitz, have argued that the transparency issue raised by the IMF was itself a smokescreen designed to mask the failures of its own aggressive policies of economic liberalization. Dude, I got to look up this motherfucker Joseph Stiglitz. He's sticking it to IMF. The corruption charges also masked the extent to which Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad was right in his claim at the time dismissed as bombast, that the crisis resulted more from international speculative, speculative money flows than from the fiscal policies of emerging economies. Countries most hurt by the crisis, like Thailand, Russia, and Indonesia, were those that had most thoroughly bought into the IMF's prescriptions. Pre prescriptions. Prescriptions. Yeah, because, well, I guess a little rundown. What IMF does is loan money. 
loan money and calculated to an extent because they've got a fucking they have a league of eco- of economists and accountants, right? So what they do is they calculate loans out for developing countries and structure them in just a way, in just a way where it's going to be impossible to pay. And if it looks like you're going to be successful paying, who do you think they call up? They call up, I don't know, some some kind of intelligence agency that's at the center of it all, like, I don't know, American or British or fucking Russian even, Germany, France, Israel, if they lend themselves to it, right? They dial up one of these um, intelligence agencies, right? And they could be recruiting niggas from the School of Americas when it was operative. If it still is, if it still is, it's running under another name. But they're essentially mercenaries for hire. (laughs) And they start shit. They start shit in your country. And I mean the type of shit that really affects infrastructure, really affects economic development. And then all of a sudden you can't pay back these loans (laughs) to the IMF. And what the IMF then comes in with their economists and their consultants and their accountants and says, you know, we, we, I mean, we could cut you a little slack, but, but you'll have to privatize some of your, some of your natural resources. <laughs> you'll have to privatize some of your natural resources in the name, in the, in the name of uh, sound economic development and global prosperity, whatever the fuck that means, right? World peace. <laughs> and uh, before you know it, they're restructuring the loan, and you still owe out the ass, but now you owe literally an arm and a leg in the country. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the IMF is better off. The IMF itself is better off than whoever runs the IMF. Like, who the fuck do you think funds the IMF? That the IMF is just running around lending money. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. Follow the money, and, and you'll you'll end up somewhere, maybe in a grave or don't follow the money and you'll still end up in the grave. But if you do it the first way, you'll go out in a blaze of glory. Hopefully not droned. Meanwhile, equally opaque, but much more protectionist countries like China and Poland, which relied on the state to manage more careful and incremental market liberalization, weathered the storm much better. Uh, and it makes me think, it makes me think, does, uh, does China have a type of agency like that? I mean, China's just got more people, period, right? China and India, these folks. So it makes me question whether or not their economies lend themselves to um, black budgets and that type and, and that sort, where funds can just be diverted to special projects, highly confidential with the latest in technology and the latest in in arms weapons and whatnot and uh i mean they could insert into a country be in and out um i mean we just saw that with a bunch of um who was it a bunch of retired were they like delta or some shit i think there were rangers i think there were rangers and seals they got caught up in cuba i think it was cuba or venezuela they're fucking around because they were disavowed and they weren't provided the resources and adequate support. This is, again, this is 2020s we're talking about. And if you didn't hear it, it's because you didn't fucking want to hear it. You're caught up in Instagram and Facebook bullshitting. All right. I digress. I'm ranting. The costs were big. Millions lost jobs across Asia. In many countries, interest rates, the cost of capital for business expansion and consumer purchases, mushroomed to 50% and more for over two years. Share prices collapsed, further crippling the ability of businesses to raise capital. The international financial community forked over $110 billion in bailouts to Indonesia, South Korea, and Thailand alone. Foreign business investments in emerging markets plummeted from $280 billion in 1997 to $150 billion in 1998, then languished around $180 billion for several years. Interest rates that emerging economy governments had to pay on their bonds became and remained much higher. (laughs) <laughs> did, did i not tell you those bonds where, where are those bonds coming from 
those loans. They're they're necessarily loans, but they're backed by something. So, dog, your word is bond, right? And if you break that shit, we break your economy. We we break your economy again. Go read it. The book is called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And shit will blow your mind. And if it and if you've already if you already have an idea of what goes on. I mean, it gives you a recounting on another level to another degree of what actually goes on in international economics. It's wild. It was such a good book. Um, They say the average premium over U.S. government bonds shot up from 5% pre-crisis to over 13%, then slowly faded to 7.5% by mid-2001. Today, many Asian economies are recovering. South Korea is a star, but investors remain far from selective about putting their money into emerging economies and exact a much higher price when they do. This crisis spawned a new mini industry, the transparency industry. In 1997, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, that's the OECD, passed an anti-bribery convention. No way. It, ha- it took place. That happened in 1997? Anti-bribery? <laughs> Transparency International, TI, formed in 1993, became a focal point for exposing and fighting political corruption in emerging economies. Corruption, in the old-fashioned sense of of envelopes stuffed in cash, is something that happens in secret. Hence, Transparency International's name and focus. Yeah, so they focus on the money, huh? What about the violence? What about the hit squads? (laughs) What about the wet work? The TI, Global Corruption Reports 2001, includes articles and research from over a dozen agencies and organizations, including the IMF the United Nations, the U.S. government, academics, and consulting firms. They all sound corrupt to me. This sounds like one giant fucking circle jerk. While transparency was the catchphrase, the focus was corruption, particularly government corruption, particularly the corruption of the government. Okay. Despite politically correct mentions of rich country issues like U.S. campaign finance, the target was government bribery in poor countries. Corporate transparency and governance received short shrift. Typically, Western firms were depicted mainly as victims, sometimes as willing accomplices. They were forced to cope with or choosing to pander to shakedowns by sleazy local politicians and officials. Get the fuck out of here. Oh my goodness. Really, it's the politicians shaking down companies? Okay. Okay, dog. Yeah, no, let's just let's just become the victim real quick. Yeah, these politicians are shaking me down. <laughs> I'm not bribing politicians. The politicians are shaking me down. Okay, sure, sure. A TI survey reported that 74% of all publications on corruption between 1990 and 1999 focused on transparency. A, oops, focused on, I messed that up. I misread that. My apologies. A TI survey reported that 74% of all publications on corruption between 1990 and 1999 focused on politics and public administration. Only 1% on business ethics. No way. (laughs) Transparency, a real issue, was merchandised as a salutary, a salutary, a salutary matchup between the bad effects of corruption on developing economies and the desires of multinational corporations to reduce transaction costs. You, you know what that means, right? They're just they're pitching money at motherfuckers to quote unquote grease the wheels. It makes transaction costs it, it reduces transaction costs. That means that they have to go that they have to jump through less regulatory hoops by paying somebody off directly and just making it happen, just just pushing them through. (laughs) Despite the shaky motives of some of these, like the IMF, who surfaced the issue, the cost of corruption in emerging economies were and remain all too real. Transparency International and its partners have shed the light of transparency on many specific examples of endemic corruption, illuminated its costs, and convinced growing numbers of leaders to tackle the problem. 
In doing so, they built the elements of a cost impact case that now can be applied to the 2002 rich country corporate governance crisis. What the fuck is this rich country rich country about, man? Because there's – when you're talking about international conglomerates, right, it's the conglomerate itself that's fucking rich regardless of what country they're in. They could be in 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 some – <laughs> we said they could be in like the poorest country, right? And it's the conglomerate itself that's rich. That's it. That's all you have to really. That's how you have to think and visualize that. It's the, like the country could be poor, and it's the conglomerate that's rich. Still, if you're in a quote unquote rich country, a first world country, if you think it got that way because the government was strong, no, nah, the corporations are strong. Uh, the first point, first point, Transparency Transparency International's 2001 Corruption Perception Index ranked more than 120 countries on the use of public power for private benefits on the basis of a composite of expert sources. The least corrupt top 24 on the list were rich market economies. Finland, with a score of 9.9 out of 10, came first. The United States ranked 16th scored badly relative to its peers, an embarrassing 7.6. It's ranked below Singapore, Canada, Australia, the United Kingdom, and Hong Kong, but above Germany, Japan, and France. Second point, TI also surveyed business leaders in 14 major emerging market economies, such as Brazil, India, and Russia, to learn which countries that invest in emerging economies are least likely to house companies that pay bribes. Again, the United States showed up in the middle of the pack, outdone by Sweden, Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, and others, i.e. these states were less apt to host bribe payers than the United States. The United States rated better than Singapore, Japan, Italy, and China. Other surveys rated U.S. companies among the most likely to have anti-bribery codes of conduct. But in the absence of transparent and verifiable reporting, and given the perceptions of emerging market leaders, U.S. firms' virtuous codes of conduct may not predict virtuous behavior. No way. You mean to tell me that codes get violated and and laws get broken? That's (laughs) that's wild. (laughs) Point three. In another survey, respondents ranked the U.S. government as by far the most likely to engage in questionable practices like diplomatic and political pressure, commercial pressure, dumping, financial pressure, tied aid, official gifts, tied defense, and arms deals. Yeah, I mean, just that point right there is all you need to go read Confessions of an Economic Hitman by John Perkins. Shit, I might make that a future audiobook if... If uh, the references in this book are enough, I might might go do that. I might do that for the podcast. Point four. Is it point four? Point four. Corruption, according to TI's research, detracts from economic, social, and environmental performance. It diminishes science and technology. It is often employed by those who cause direct harm to air quality and water quality among other measures. In other words, corruption corrodes the foundations of sustainable competition. Yeah, that's beautifully put. That last point right there is beautifully put. And it's funny because there's a lot of, you know, autism is on the rise, right? So there's a a lot of smart, specialized, very niche, very hyper-focused individuals who might be uh, gung ho on like one thing, really uber focused on like one thing. It could be planes, trains, automobiles, science, math, English, history, right? One thing, right? And then they get exploited by motherfuckers in corporate, motherfuckers like me, right? I've done it before. I know folks who've done it before. I may not do that as much because I've learned. I've changed my ways. And it's not just out for personal interest. I don't have much to show, right? I'm not doing this podcast, sitting on a beach somewhere, drinking umbrella drinks, sipping pina coladas and and counting how many Panamanian 
uh, or how many Panamanian accounts I have in some tax haven. No, 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 no. I've recapacitated and I've retooled, I've retrained my brain to instead of being an economic hitman, I'm a corporate cowboy. That's the point of this podcast. Continuing, continuing. A parallel PricewaterhouseCoopers PwC study looked at the cost of opacity. Opacity, opacity. I, I keep fucking that up. Opacity, opacity. Quote, the lack of clear, accurate, formal, easily discernible, and widely accepted practices in the business environment. Its expert survey of 35 mostly emerging economies rated corruption and four other areas of concern, the legal and judicial environment, including shareholder rights, economic policy, accounting and corporate governance, and regulatory uncertainty slash arbitrariness. Believe it or not, respondents rated Singapore as the least opaque, i.e. the most transparent, on these business criteria. Its weak record on civil rights was not factored in. The United States, Chile, and the United Kingdom followed closely. Then PwC quantified the impact of opacity as if it were a tax on foreign investment or an incremental cost of doing business with Singapore as the zero baseline. The United States opacity tax was measured as 5%, Hong Kong's 12%, Mexico's 15%, Japan's 25%, and China's 46%. PwC also assigned an opacity risk premium to each country, equivalent to the amount of interest above the U.S. level that opacity would add to the cost of government bonds. Hong Kong's risk premium came out at 2.3%, Mexico's 3.1%, Japan's 6.3%, and China's 13.2%. I'm not going to explain those. If you are listening to this audiobook and you know what the fuck you're looking for, you know what you're looking at, you know what you're listening to, then I'm not going to explain that shit. <laughs> By early 2001, the international, I mean, go back, rewind it, listen to it again if necessary, pull context clues from it in order to find, because they're analogizing transparency and opacity to a tax, a tax on the cost of doing business. There, I boiled it down for you. I distilled it for you. If you're still confused, if you continue to not understand, rewind that shit and re-listen to it. By early 2001, the international policy community, spearheaded by many U.S. experts, was teaching several lessons from the Asian financial crisis. First, opacity combined with corruption and self-dealing can cause deep and sustained economic crises. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Well, fucking, I just learned something new. For second, second, opacity hurts businesses and raises their transaction costs. Investors lose trust, withdraw from capital markets, and increase the price they exact from companies for loans and investments. Sure. Okay. Third, opacity costs taxpayers, businesses, and consumers as governments are forced to intervene with bailouts and social safety nets, while their cost of borrowing increases due to the opacity risk premium. Well, nobody said you had to bail out, folks, right? Nobody said you have to bail out these too big to fail motherfuckers. Anybody can fail. Anybody could get it. Everybody is entry level forever. That's pretty much the, uh, the, the, the mantra of a corporate cowboy. You are entry level forever. You think you make it to the top, you take one moment to settle, you settle for just a little bit, you get clipped. That shit's easy. All the research we've cited was pre-Enron. In the PwC survey, U.S. respondents were highly optimistic about the quality and impact of accounting standards in their own business environment. From the beginnings of the Asian crisis through early 2001, U.S. commentators, often supported by leaders of global institutions like IMF and World Bank, preached that the U.S. system of corporate disclosure was the model 
for the rest of the world to emulate. Yeah, well, I'm not going to comment on that too heavily. I, I want to I wanna continue with this book. Enron and the shock and scandals that followed silenced the preachers <laughs> as they realized that their claimed causes of the Asian financial crisis applied to the U.S. The chickens had come home to roost, so they say. Opacity it literally means that they made their bed and they had now they had to fucking sleep in it. Now they got a pillow. Now they got smothered with a fucking pillow in the very bed that they made. Opacity combined with corruption and self-dealing had led to a deep economic crisis. The crisis may not turn out to be as sustained as it was in Asia because of the fundamental strengths of the U.S. economy through current fiscal and disclosure policies. Hold on. Though, sorry, it says, though current fiscal and disclosure policies further undermine the strength. But the costs of the 2002 meltdown will remain with us for a long time. The crisis has hurt many businesses. Investors withdrew from capital markets and set higher performance hurdles as a precondition for their return. Although the cost of borrowing declined rather than increased, this was because the fallout of the transparency crisis. All of the costs, let me reread that because I had fucking, I gotta take a drink. Hold on. A little H2O. Although the cost of borrowing declined rather than increased, this was because the fallout from the transparency crisis combined with a trade deficit, industrial overcapacity, and productivity growth delayed a recovery from recession. As a result, the Federal Reserve continued to push rates down. But even though interest rates were low, risk money remained hard to get. Why? Could it be that there were more regulators with their fingers on the buttons and their hands on the phones getting insider connects? Uh, well, let's continue. I don't fucking know. <laughs> Specific costs of the U.S. transparency crisis were clear and diverse. Enron's fraudulent, semi-concealed, off-balance sheet activities and subsequent bankruptcy destroyed $90 billion of market capitalization. 21,000 jobs in a major accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, RIP, rest in piss, and helped dash the retirement plans of millions of Americans. That sucks. And did anybody die from that? Or did people just get arrested and go to jail? I don't know. Questions, questions. It falsified over seven billion dollars in costs and went into bankruptcy with debts of 41 billion. These and other failed companies created billions of dollars in bad debts for banks and other lending institutions. The federal government opened more than 100 corporate crime investigations and charged over 150 people with fraud. The trustworthiness of Wall Street's biggest names, Goldman Sachs, Citibank, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, and Credit Suisse, First Boston, was cast into doubt. Well, I mean, half of those motherfuckers laundered for the cartel and the other half for what? Funding Epstein or some shit? Brokerage firms eventually faced fines of $1.4 billion and laid off, laid off thousands of employees as millions of individuals dropped out of the stock market. Damn. But the play but like the players, like these people didn't drop out? Weird. A da <laughs> the damage swelled into a market panic reminiscent of the days of the robber barons. From reminiscent? From <laughs> my bad. I'm cracking myself up because like every sentence now, I'm just I'm just sarcastically commentating on this shit. My bad. I'm I will tone it down some. I will read it through and um Keep the breaks intermittent, okay? Keep the interjections intermittent, okay? From March 19, 2002 to July 19, 2002, the peak of the transparency crisis, Standard & Poor's 500 index, lost 28% of its value, dropping from 1,170 1, to 848, long after the technology stock bubble had burst. In an August 2002 analysis, the Brookings Institute estimated that for as long as the transparency crisis prevents 
the stock market from recovering to 2000 to March 2002 levels, it will cost the U.S. economy a significant and ever-growing portion of its gross domestic product due to reduced consumer buying and business spending. Specifically, it forecasted a reduction in gross domestic product between two-tenths and about half of a percent over a one-year period, equivalent to $21 billion to $50 billion, compounding to half of a percent to 1.19% over three years, and 1.05% to 2.5% over 10 years. The Brookings forecast assumed no corrective action, but the cost of the crisis was all too obvious to government and business leaders. Steps were taken to improve both the appearance and realities of corporate transparency beginning in early August, starting with congressional hearings, starting with congressional hearings and legislation, in hopes that the worst was over. By late fall, the markets started to improve. A springtime rally pushed the S&P up in the 1,000 range by early July 2003. This was still well below its pre-crisis peak. Investors remained skittish. Next little subheading here, stakeholder webs, countervails to opacity. Whether it knows it or not, every company has a stakeholder web, an S web. What, what the fuck is up with these, with these shorts, with these uh, acronyms, not acronyms. What are they? Abbreviations, S webs and B webs. They're, they're just networks, <laughs> but I get it. Maybe they're being, they're, they're, they're qualifying and further defining, describing what these webs are constituted of, right? So stakeholder webs. Okay, whether it knows it or not, every company has a stakeholder web, an S web, maybe several. A stakeholder web is a network of, see, a network. Could you say fucking, I said network. A stakeholder web is a network of stakeholders that scrutinizes and attempts to influence a corporation's behavior. Recently, many have studied, many have studied, recently, many have studied these networks and given them different names, including transparency networks, corporate responsibility clusters, network armies, and smart mobs. But as business critic Amy Cortese says, quote, whether you choose to call them, whatever you choose to call them, these forces are products of the internet age, united not by geography, but by common cause and technology that lets them communicate freely and instantly. End quote. A key characteristic of many S-webs is self-organization. Self-organizing systems, such as the open source movement that produced Linux, are fundamentally different from and often subversive of traditional hierarchical organizations. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Because uh, that's pretty much what facilitates you know, corporate cowboys, what enables corporate cowboys to operate inside and outside corporations. They display intentional emergence, whereby strong patterns emerge from complex, initially random systems through the application of a few simple rules, like being a corporate, like everybody's entry level forever. (laughs) That's what, that's what puts the fear of God into people, not God itself, you, you put the fear in others, that everyone is entry level forever and can get knocked off at a moment's notice. If they fuck up the bag, if they create bad business, they got bad blood immediately. Immediately. They just but I mean if that if that were the case since the dawn of time, I mean we wouldn't have poverty, we wouldn't have starvation, we wouldn't have pestilence and war and famine and 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 all these other social diseases, right? But um Yo, I mean, if God's real, so is the devil. So the devil's here, apparently. Emergence has captured the imaginations of scientists, researchers, and analysts in many disciplines, including biology, mathematics, and economics. Unlike 
most naturally occurring emergent systems, humans apply intentionality in many of their emergent systems. They make deliberate choices on the basis of their ideas, goals, and desires. Nonetheless, the cumulative effect of self-organized, sorry, nonetheless, the cumulative effect is self-organized rather than orchestrated. Stakeholder webs actively investigate, evaluate, and seek to change the behaviors of institutions, such as corporations, to achieve better alignment of the values and interests of their participants. Man, I don't know. I, I, find, I find myself being more realist, more, more cynical as, uh, as time goes on. But that's only because some of the participants have found ways to legislate themselves out of any liability. And that goes to show, I mean, there's, there used to be governments made by people for the people. And um, every couple of generations, that power gets usurped and gets violated before, <clears throat> before motherfuckers start getting clipped. <laughs> in 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 Minecraft, like like the youngsters say, in Minecraft, fucking that's some corporate cowboy shit. The next subheading here: seven characteristics of stakeholder webs. <laughs> the fuck? What happened to S webs? <clears throat> One, the embodiment of transparency. Transparency is not an am amorphous disembodied force. Its tangible expression, the S-Web, there you go, realizes the ability of stakeholders to find out information, inform others, and self-organize. S-Web participants connect via interactive media like the internet, email, the telephone, instant messaging, fax, holy shit, this is from 2002, fax, and face-to-face -face communications. They also use traditional print, radio, television, mass media. The new transparency increases the power and influence of S-Webs. S-Web structures and behaviors made possible by the internet very much resemble it. An S-Web works very differently from a typical top-down company or business web. Its modus operandi is peer collaboration. Peer, peer as in your, your relative peer, as in your colleagues. Its modus operandi is peer collaboration rather than hierarchical control. An S, um, like the internet, like the internet, an S-web structure is highly distributed. An S-web, a S-web is highly adaptive. It can spring into action quickly and fade just as fast. Instead of spending energy trying to tear down obstacles, it routes itself around them. Ironically, there is often considerable opacity within an S-Web, as various participants may not be fully aware of who the other members are. Nestle's stakeholders, figure 2.1, focused initially on the company's reported efforts to encourage mothers in developing countries to abandon breastfeeding in favor of using its packaged infant formula. <laughs> This is from 2002? Yo, Nestle be on some shit. More recently, the chocolate industry has rocked... No, sorry. The chocolate... I'm fucking this one up. More recently, the chocolate industry was rocked by revelations that its supply chain was tainted by child slavery, in turn changing the composition and activity within Nestle's S-Web. The effects rippled from NGOs to nearly all the company's stakeholders. Some customers were turned off by the stigma of eating chocolate made by slaves. Employees were demoralized by bad press. Supply chain partners were forced to raise standards and participate in new monitoring systems. And investors worried that the scandal might affect the firm's stock price and long-term prospects. Yeah, uh, there's a whole, um, uh, I don't know if, if by the time you're listening to this, Reddit is still a thing, but there's a whole ass subreddit that I've seen that I've come across called Fuck Nestle, r slash Fuck Nestle. That's funny. Uh, two, one of the, the, 
Characteristic number two of stakeholder webs, varying participant motives and roles. S-Web players can be motivated for a variety of reasons. Religious groups use moral principles to examine and change corporate behavior. Some players, such as employees who organize to change a company's pension policy or shareholders who try to force a company to adopt good governance, are motivated by self-interest. Some have an ideological motivation ranging from a desire for better corporate citizenship to a desire to weaken corporations and end corporate's power. I'm, I'm kind of in between. Corporate cowboys, I think, are a little bit in between. We're in between every motherfucking thing. Some may turn out to be agents of competitors. Shit, corporate cowboys might be just that. Corporate regulators are mandated to uphold the law. Corporate regulators? What about corporate regulators? What about corporate cowboys? <laughs> Regulating. Um, just taking a quick look at figure 2.1. They refer to Nestle's stakeholder web. And uh, really, it's just Nestle in the middle and a bunch of circles with arrows going every motherfucking where for, um, for their stakeholder web. And they're numbered. They're numbered from 1 to 12. So I'll read them off here pretty quickly. Number one is investors. And then there's an arrow. There's, I mean, the, the arrows go from every circle to every other circle, essentially. So number one is investors. Two is supply chain. Three is anti-globalization groups. Funny. Four is women's groups. Funny. Er. Five is environmental groups. Six is labor groups. Seven is the media. Eight is government. Nine is customers. Ten is mass action groups. Eleven is other non-governmental organizations, other NGOs. And twelve is trade organizations, which is funny because there is an anti-globalization group in here and a trade organization. So, yeah, I would, Im I would imagine some opacity exists. They don't know or maybe they pretend yeah, I'm going to say they pretend. They pretend that the other doesn't exist or they pretend that they don't know about the other's motives and interests. But, I mean, if we're being real here, if we're, if we're being real in the name of business, whatever bad business looks like, they're probably shaking hands on that. <laughs> yeah, anti-globalization and world trade, sure. Uh, participants also play different roles, it says. Some S-Web participants act as leaders coordinating the rules and activities of others. The AFL-CIO is central to the S-Web that scrutinizes Coca-Cola, coordinating investigations, exposés, and activities aimed at changing labor practices in the company's bottling plants. Some play the role of content provider, researching and communicating critical information to other members. Greenpeace provided intelligence to the Rainforest Action Network about Home Depot's old growth forest logging. Some play other roles, linking the corporation, amplifying and relaying communications to other network participants, conducting litigation, proposing shareholder resolutions, and so on. Malcolm Gladwell describes three kinds of people. It's the same model that could be applied to organizations who apply special roles in mobilizing human networks, connectors, mavens, and salesmen. Connectors know lots of other well-connected, influential people. They also have a special gift for bringing the world together. Mavens are obsessive experts in a narrow field, like the Otis, I guess, the fucking Otis. They love to share their knowledge and other people trust their advice, right? Gladwell suggests that Paul Revere, who mobilized a stakeholder web that sparked the American Revolution, was both a connector, he knew lots of important people, and a maven. He had the inside scoop on the British Army's plans and shared it with the important people who trusted him. The third type of mobilizer is the salesman a person with an infectious, sometimes subliminal, ability to persuade. Given the right situation and an effective mix of such special people, an S-Web becomes an unstoppable force. So you in your own life, listener, 
reader, consider which one of the three that you are, what you're strongest at, what you uh, could practice in, not what you're weakest in, but what which one you have the most opportunity, and go practice that. You want to be capable in all three. Otherwise, you're going to end up being taken advantage of. If you think you can specialize in one area and not know how to talk to people, not know how to interact professionally, you're going to get bent over and fucked. The third characteristic, changing dynamics. Changing dynamics. S-webs can be relatively inactive, quiet, benign, reflective, small, stable, and slow-moving. Or they can be intensely active, huge, volatile, and powerful. Several dynamics are at work. An S-web can move from one state to another, inactive to active, small to large, hostile to cooperative, almost instantaneously. Network effects come into play. A bigger network is exponentially more valuable to participants and impactful on its target. Uh, damn, that was, so the first point, the, the first point was the S-Web. The first point is an S-Web can move from one state to another, inactive to active. The second point was network effects come into play. A bigger network is exponentially more valuable. Uh, the third point is in S-Webs, transparency works a bit like osmosis. Says researcher Anthony Williams, in networks like these, quote, information flows freely from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration where it disseminates rapidly across space and time. Point four, r- rumors travel flat, r- rumors travel fast. And they pretty much travel flat too. I know I misspoke there, but they necessarily travel flat along, along, peop- along the level of people that you know. It's rare that the person above you learns before the person next to you. That's it's rare. It's rare unless you know you're making a move, unless you're making a corporate play, but uh, it's rare. Uh, rumors travel fast, but validation can be swift as well. Sophisticated S webs have good nonsense detectors because misinformation, especially when initiated by members, can hurt the network. Point five, local networks can become global fast as digital information does not respect boundaries. Point six, the S-Web has a marvelous quality, persistence, based on its ability to archive. Information that was placed in it years ago can still be available today, ready to use. Similarly, linkages among S-Web participants may lie dormant for a time, ready to be reactivated when needed. The fourth characteristic, variable corporate engagement. Firms have various levels of engagement with their S-webs. A company may not even be aware that it is operating under the scrutiny of an S-web. Some S-webs we analyzed had no interaction at all with the target firm. Other firms systematically engage their S-webs to learn, influence them, or harness their power to help build a better business. Engagement pays off. Hewlett Packard uses consumer inputs to identify product problems. Johnson & Johnson engages employees to ensure that its credo guides their behavior. Shell turned parts of a hostile A-web. A-web? What the fuck is an A-web? Hold on, hold on. An A-web? What the fuck? Oh, it's a typo. Okay, that's a typo. Uh, it's a fucking typo. So, uh, so there's still S webs. There, there's there is no A web. At least not yet. There's a B web. That's the business web, or a business network. And there's an S web, which is a stakeholder web. So, like a stakeholder network. There is no A web. So, Shell turned parts of a hostile S web into a network that supports its sustainability agenda. When activity in the S web is high, while engagement is low. Companies can be drawn into a trust crisis. Refer to figure 2.2. And figure 2.2, just real quick, I'll describe it for you, is the same graph that we saw in part one, chapter one, in chapter one. 
uh, essentially where you have it is similar in the sense that there is two axes, the x and the y axes, and then its um, its origin were like the zero zero, where like the they meet together in the bottom left. Then as they expand up and outwards, they create quadrants, right? The y axis, the one that goes up and down, is rated from low at the bottom to high at the top, and that is named engagement with the firm, right? The x axis starts with low to, uh, on the left hand side and high at the far right hand side. That's labeled s web activity. Now, the bottom left quadrant is called the danger zone, the top left quadrant is called the opportunity zone. The top right quadrant is called the sustainability zone. And the bottom right quadrant is called trust crisis. All right, we're continuing. So when web, so when activity in the S web is high while engagement is low, companies can be drawn into a trust crisis. Figure 2.2. Unengaged activity has a centrifugal force where the S web migrates away from the firm and can become alienated from the firm, its values and its activities. Conversely, lack of engagement robs a corporation of the opportunity to evolve and strengthen its values to be consistent with those of its stakeholders. For both parties, lack of engagement undermines the quest for commonly shared values, in turn, generating mistrust. Characteristic number five, big trouble, trust crisis. Gladwell's concept of the tipping point is an apt description of what happens when a small event suddenly turns a stakeholder web with the force of an epidemic from an amorphous collection of stakeholders into an uncontrollable trust crisis. New information or events can suddenly precipitate a trust crisis. When Baxter International became implicated in the deaths of patients of its renal care products for kidney treatments, that's what renal means, renal, R-E-N-A-L, in case you didn't know, renal, the company was swept into a trust state where everything became subservient to dealing with the trust crisis. Most big companies have faced at least one trust crisis precipitated by a trust event. They muddled Exxon Valdez or managed Johnson & Johnson Tylenol through with varying degrees of damage or new strength. The generalized trust crisis of 2002, <laughs> the generalized trust crisis, just fucking everybody was mistrusting each other <laughs> and distrusting each other. The generalized trust crisis of 2002 was precipitated by several companies that disappeared almost overnight. No way. <laughs> trust destroyed. Society revoked their license to operate. I don't know about that. Just their license to operate. So again, I, I, I refer back to my question. I return to my question. Nobody fucking died from that? Like no, no heads literally rolled? That's weird. Characteristic six, a company's response to a trust crisis, effect on its future and its viability. Firms have shown two diametrically opposed methods of dealing with a trust crisis. One is to use conventional public relations tactics to quell it. The other is to engage the S-Web in active discussions and processes to resolve issues. The traditional approach uses advertising, PR campaigns, spin, misinformation, criticizing the critics, spoofing, like posing as an S-Web member and providing phony information, pitting one group against the other and other dirty tricks. Such approaches usually have the opposite to the desired effect. They tend to inflame activity in the S-Web and attack is fodder for increased communications as participants inform others, rebut or reply to the attack and reorganize themselves. The S-Web is an organism whose antibodies gain strength by combating intruders. Engagement is a far more effective philosophy and approach. 
a corporate spirit of open communications, listening, consideration of participants' interests, admission of wrongdoing if appropriate, consultation, commitment to change, abiding by commitments, accountability, and transparency all have the effect of reducing crisis activity and restoring trust. Nestle is again a case in point. In 1999, BBC, oh sorry, a 1999 BBC documentary revealed that several cocoa plantations in the Ivory Coast used slave labor to produce the raw materials sold to chocolate retailers like Nestle, Cadbury, and Hershey. Observers were quick to accuse the industry of complicity in slavery. The chocolate industry vigorously denied responsibility, saying that companies bought raw materials on commodity exchanges and had no way of knowing how cocoa was produced. A deadlock seemed inevitable, and many individuals and organizations called for boycotts. But after further dialogue among anti-slavery NGOs, concerned government agencies, and the chocolate industry, a consensus emerged that slavery had to be eradicated from the supply chain. Everyone understood that boycotts would cause great harm, not just to the reputations and profits of manufacturers and retailers, but also to the many African farmers who depended on income from cocoa production. In a July 2002 agreement, the industry agreed to fund research into the extent of the problem and to take steps in cooperation with the government of the Ivory Coast to eliminate slavery. That shit's laughable. Anyways, that shit's fucking laughable. Okay, yeah, so they're going to spend money on finding ways to, 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 what, are, what is it? To uh, increase the cost of making chocolate? Sure, sure, fam. Sure, let's pretend that happened. Also, an independent board consisting of a broad array of stakeholders was set up to monitor progress. A potentially explosive issue was resolved without boycotts or lawsuits, relying instead on dialogue and cooperation. Sure. Not coercion, cooperation. Right, right. And with NGOs and governments as partners, the chocolate industry can legitimately claim that its supply chains are free of slave labor. <clears throat> that, ladies and gents, is called plausible deniability. <laughs> characteristic seven, last characteristic of s -Webs. A powerful force for corporate transformation. Ooh. S-Webs existed in pre-internet days, but their speed of communication and therefore effectiveness was glacial. That means slow, moving slow like a glacier, like a fucking glacier, moving slow, really, really slow. The net supercharges an S-Web, enabling it to quickly become a powerful, often global force for change. Because engagement is the only effective way to deal with crisis, S-Webs change the behavior of corporations. The firm engages. Information begins to flow back and forth. Both parties learn and behavior changes. Engagement creates new feedback loops which constrain or help correct unacceptable behaviors while encouraging new values and behaviors that conform to the expectations of the network. Anthony Williams says, quote, when information disclosed to the public reveals inconsistencies between the conduct of corporations and acceptable standards of behavior, network participants must put new forms of accountability into motion. As we shall see, S-Webs, by motivating corporations to be accountable, reward them for being trustworthy. We live in an era in which stakeholder webs supersede government's ability to influence some behaviors of the private sector and market. Ever since the South African boycotts hastened the end of apartheid, activists have been perfecting this new kind of markets campaign. Now, the internet enables stakeholders to construct far-flung networks 
to influence corporate behavior by attacking corporate brands and mobilizing public opinion. Any company with a reputation and brand to protect is vulnerable. Even firms that are isolated from consumers can be made to acquiesce, usually by targeting the firm's partners at the retail end of the supply chain. When we explain the notion of S-Webs to business executives, some react with concern, even fear. <laughs> Good. Fucking, you should fear corporate cowboys. What the fuck? Memo to business leaders, though. S-Webs are good for you. This will help you be trustworthy. Engage with them. Engage with us. Learn and build trust. Trust is the sine qua non for viability and performance in the new business environment. And S-Webs are a new force for corporate success and shareholder value. In summary, there are real limits to transparency and forces mobilized in favor of opacity. The experience of emerging economies and of the United States clearly shows that opacity breeds corruption, markets failures, and poor underlying business conditions. Stakeholder webs are an unstoppable force for a new glass nose in business and capitalist society. The train has left the station. Nevertheless, as we've seen, battles around openness rage on. Yeah, that's the fucking, that's the corporate war, essentially. Ladies and gentlemen, that ends chapter two of the naked corporation. How the age of transparency will revolutionize business. Authored by Don Tapscott and David Ticol. Published 2002 by Free Press. And read to you by yours truly, Alex, a corporate cowboy. Catch you on the next one.